Peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, affects around 10 million Americans and is due to atherosclerosis, a systemic disease of the cardiovascular system. PAD causes the lumen of the arteries to narrow due to buildup of plaque and calcium in the arterial wall. Most people with PAD also have plaque in their carotid and coronary arteries and are at increased risk for stroke and or heart attack and they are likely to have lesions in multiple sites. The atherosclerosis may make itself known first in the legs with leg pain while walking or exercising. This is known as intermittent claudication. People with diabetes are at increased risk of developing PAD. Treatment can include smoking cessation, controlling high blood pressure, statins and other methods for controlling lipid levels, dietary changes, exercise, getting diabetes under control, and surgery. The pain caused by PAD can range from mild pain only with exercise to severe pain even while at rest and is a major limitation to mobility for many individuals. It often limits the ability to get the exercise needed to stay healthy. In its most severe forms, PAD can lead to ulcerations and sores on legs and feet that do not heal and critical limb ischemia that can cause gangrene and require amputation. Stroke and heart attack are the more serious and most common complications associated with PAD. Over a five-year period, 20% of patients with PAD will sustain a non-fatal stroke or MI and 30% will have a fatal event. With critical limb ischemia, 30% have amputations and 20% will be dead within six months. There are approximately 160,000 amputations due to PAD performed annually in the U.S., costing around $10 billion. In 2009, the Society for Interventional Radiology announced a study that found that combining Framingham scores with ABIs identified an additional 45% of study participants thought to be at low risk of MI and or stroke that were, in fact, at high risk. The ABI is an easy-to-perform non-invasive test which compares the highest systolic brachial pressure to the highest ankle pressure by dividing the ankle pressure by the brachial pressure. The resulting number is the ankle brachial index. A normal ABI is 1.0 or 100%. A number below 0.99 shows the presence of decreased arterial blood flow due to PAD, with the disease severity increasing as the number gets lower. Occasionally, a diabetic patient will have very stiff vessels that are non-compressible due to calcification of the arterial walls, and they will have an ABI greater than 1.3. To determine perfusion to the foot, these patients should also have a TBI, toe brachial index, performed, since the toes do not have the same calcification problem as leg vessels. The patient should be asked to refrain from smoking for at least two hours prior to testing to decrease the chance of peripheral vascular constriction. They should remove socks and shoes and any long sleeves. The patient should lie supine with the limbs at the same level as the heart in a comfortable position in a warm room. If they are cold, a blanket should be provided. The patient needs to rest for at least 10 minutes with 15 to 20 minutes being ideal. The goal is for the patient to relax so the pressures measured will be stable at the resting baseline. This time can be used for interviewing the patient, explaining the test, checking pedal pulses and sensation in the feet, listening to the heart or palpating the abdomen. Equipment needed. You have everything you need in the portable ABI kit, which includes a 5 MHz bidirectional continuous wave Doppler, chart recorder, aneroids sphygmomanometer, cuff inflator, two SC12 and two SC10 straight segmental cuffs, chart paper, and coupling gel. You will also need paper and pencil or pen and a calculator for documenting the pressures and index. Select the appropriate sized cuff for each limb. You will need one cuff for each upper arm and one for each ankle. Measure the cuff to the diameter of the limb. The cuff width should be 20% larger than the limb diameter to compress all of the soft tissue evenly. The cuff should be put on straight and fit snugly but not tight. You must use vascular cuffs, which have long bladders to completely encircle the limb and compress all of the soft tissue. Locate the arm cuffs high enough to avoid covering the elbow. Ankle cuffs go on the actual ankle, not mid-calf. Leave enough room to obtain the pressures from the arteries. The pressure is actually measured at the cuff location, not at the site where the signals are obtained. 
Put the cuffs on the arms and ankles once the patient is supine. Have the sphygmomanometer, patient chart, etc. in the room ready to use. A patient can relax best if undisturbed. Have the paper and pen for noting the pressures handy. This is a good time to remind the patient that they need to rest quietly and not talk. Inform them that you will tell them what the blood pressure is after they have all been taken. Telling the patient what the blood pressure is during the procedure can actually make a change, usually to a higher reading. The order for taking pressures doesn't matter, so if you prefer to do ankles first, that works fine. Some people prefer to take the ankle pressures first so as not to bias themselves as to the level of systolic pressure. After the rest period, take the first brachial pressure in the antecubital fossa at the elbow. Find the brachial pulse with your fingers and then put some ultraphonic gel on that place. Use enough gel. Too little and you will not make a good contact. Too much and you will skate around on the gel and have difficulty controlling the Doppler. Obtain a good Doppler signal or sound and waveform printout to establish a baseline. Be patient and move the Doppler around slowly in order to find the best pulse. Be sure to angle the Doppler with the tip of the Doppler transducer facing toward the blood flow of the artery, towards the patient's head. The angle should be between 45 and 60 degrees to the skin surface. The MD6 Doppler has a flashing green LED near the tip when you are over an artery, and the brightness increases when you have the best possible pulse. A red flashing light is for flow away from the Doppler or venous flow. While holding the tip of the Doppler on the artery, Slowly inflate the cuff until the sound and waveform disappear. Inflate an additional 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above that number, super systolic, but no higher. Higher pressures are not necessary and are uncomfortable for the patient. Slowly deflate the cuff, around 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury at a time, until the Doppler signal sound reappears. The waveform will follow immediately after the sound. The pressure reading when the first sound appears is the systolic pressure. Deflate the cuff completely and record the systolic pressure. Remove the excess gel. Move to the next pressure, either brachial or ankle. When taking ankle pressures, it is very important that the patient's feet are warm to the touch so that the circulation is adequate for the test. To find the posterior tibial pulse, locate the medial malleolus. The posterior tibial pulse is 2 to 3 centimeters below and behind it. This pulse is deeper than the dorsalis pedis, so it requires a bit more care and concentration to palpate. Once you have palpated the pulse, put gel on the spot and using the Doppler, angled toward the patient's head about 45 to 60 degrees, obtain the Doppler signal and waveform. Again, find the spot and angle with the loudest sound and best waveform. Inflate the cuff until the sound and waveform disappear, and then inflate from 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above that number, supersystolic. Ankle cuffs can be painful, so do not inflate higher than necessary. Slowly deflate the cuff around 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury at a time until the Doppler signal reappears. The waveform will follow immediately after the sound. The pressure reading when the first sound appears is the systolic pressure. Deflate the cuff completely and record the systolic pressure for that site. Remove the excess gel. Be sure to run strips at each site because the waveform also shows evidence of health or disease. Next, perform the Dorsalis pedis pulse exam. To find the pulse, place fingers on the area between the line of the first and second toe, halfway down the dorsum of the foot. Put your fingers between the big toe and second toe at their base and move your fingers slowly back toward the ankle and you will find the dorsalis pedis. You are over the navicular and intermediate cuneiform bones. The pulse can be felt where the artery passes over this area of the foot. Occasionally, this pulse cannot be palpated on healthy feet because the artery may be small or just not the dominant vessel. Put gel on the pulse and obtain the best Doppler signal and waveform. Inflate the cuff until the sound and waveform disappear and then inflate from 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above that number, supersystolic. Slowly deflate the cuff around 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury at a time until the sound reappears. The waveform will follow immediately after the sound. The pressure reading when the first sound appears is the systolic pressure. Deflate the cuff completely and record the systolic pressure. Remove the excess gel. Repeat these exams on the other side of the patient. 
To calculate the ABI, divide the highest ankle systolic pressure by the highest brachial pressure for the index. The concept we are following is that the brachial pressures represent the systemic blood pressure. If one arm pressure is higher than the other, there may be subclavian artery obstruction on the side with the low pressure. Therefore, we use the higher of the two arms as our reference for the most accurate systemic pressure. Never just use right arm right leg, left arm left leg. The ankle pressures should be about the same or higher, although they are rarely all the same. If one ankle artery is much lower, it probably has some proximal obstruction and should be investigated. By using the highest ankle pressure, we are measuring the highest functional level of the leg. If the objective were to detect any disease that may be present, we would want to note the lowest pressure. The American Heart Association gives the following ABI interpretation levels. Above 1.3, you will need to pay close attention to the Doppler waveforms and obtain toe pressures. 1.00 to 1.29. These patients will usually have normal exercise tolerance. 0 0.91 to 0 0.99. These patients may still be within normal limits, but an exercise test may uncover a low degree of obstruction that is difficult to document with a resting test only. 0 0.41 to 0 0.90. These patients will certainly experience intermittent claudication when they walk or exercise due to a drop in their ankle pressures. 0, 0.00 to 0 0.40. These patients are at risk of or may be experiencing rest pain and or failure to heal injury to the foot or toes. Although there are other organizations that slice and dice the 0 0.91 and below levels into other categories, they agree that above 1.3, the ankle arteries are too calcified to be compressible and should have a TBI or toe brachial index performed. They also agree that below 1.00 is abnormal. An ABI provides three forms of information. The first is the Doppler sound, which to trained or educated ears has characteristic sounds for triphasic, biphasic, and monophasic waveforms. The ability to hear the differences comes with practice. The second is the index or numerical result from dividing the ankle systolic pressure by the brachial systolic pressure and comparing the results with known guidelines. The third is the waveform, which shows the elasticity of the artery and its response to the pressure of the pulsating blood flow, as well as the current state of vasoactivity, dilation and constriction of the arteries. The waveforms should be examined, especially the ankle waveforms. Normal, young, healthy adults have a triphasic, multiphasic waveform with a brisk upstroke, sharp pointed peak, and return to above the baseline. Healthy vessels have more elasticity, which creates the triphasic waveform as a response to the pulsation of the blood through the vessel. A biphasic waveform is also considered healthy but mildly abnormal. It represents a state of vasodilatation that could be caused by mild disease, increased flow secondary to inflammation, or simply increased flow following exercise. A waveform that flattens out and becomes more monophasic and rounded shows more and more progressive disease. The normal triphasic or multiphasic Doppler arterial waveform has an initial steep peak representing the pulse of high flow during cardiac systole. The second phase, moving downward, indicates the reverse flow in early diastole. The third phase is a small peak that signifies the forward flow during late diastole. People particularly at risk for PAD include less than 50 years of age with diabetes and one other atherosclerosis risk factor, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, or hyperhomocystinemia. Note, hyperhomocystinemia is in dispute currently. Age 50 to 69 years with history of diabetes or smoking. 70 years of age and older. Leg symptoms upon exertion, intermittent claudication or ischemic rest pain. Abnormal leg, ankle or foot pulse examination. Known atherosclerotic, carotid, coronary or renal artery disease. Psoriasis increases risk of PAD, MI and CVA. Not all people with PAD are symptomatic. 
In the general population, only 10% of people with PAD have the classic symptoms of intermittent claudication.